Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask GN. I think we're on episode 41. As always, if you have questions, leave them in the comment section below. I've given up on the upvote, downvote thing. I'm just reading through all of them again because YouTube doesn't work properly. But before getting to that, this content is brought to you by Catalyst Gaming Mints, an energy boost designed for gamers to increase focus and energy while eliminating dyes, sugar, calories, and chemicals that energy drinks contain. Hit the link in the description below and use code GAMERSNEXUS for 5% off. So, first order of business. This is a different shirt. I actually have many shirts. You might not know that. Uh, I think there are two instances ever where in a Gamers Nexus video I've not had a GN shirt on. One was an interview with Kent Smith three years ago in California about SSDs and uh, preconditioning and, then, and right amplification factor. The other one was with Jim Vincent recently when we were at CES and did a look at his poor man's laptop setup, which was actually a really fun video. Speaking of CES, though, the first question, oh, I, I should mention, by the way, uh, we're playing around with shirt designs. So this might be something or something similar to it anyway, that we end up using as a reward for Patreon backers. So folks who contribute to Patreon in the future will probably add more shirts than the main one that I normally wear. Uh, we just have to work out which material to use and stuff like that. This is a much nicer shirt material. So uh, CES questions. The one I wanted to get to, John Adamson asked, what was the mic that Steve used during CES? And I actually saw several people ask this while we were at the show in comments for multiple videos. Uh, so this is not a secret. I've talked about this mic before. I've had it for several years now. This was the first piece of audio equipment that I bought uh, when I was still setting up all the film and audio and everything myself. So this is at least three years old now, might be four. Uh, I think it might be four. And it is a Sennheiser MD46. When I got it, it cost me $200. We've improved it since then by adding a wireless transmitter for our fairly expensive Sennheiser uh, G3 wireless transmitters and receivers. But it's been the same mic, just the transmission has changed. The mic itself is what you'd call a reporter mic or a stick mic. I bought it originally because I was looking at, uh, I, I wanted to know what was a good reporter mic we could use with decent audio quality for a loud environment. So actually what I did was at the time I went and I looked at photos of uh, presidential conferences and looked at the microphones they used for when the president spoke because I figured, well, that should probably be pretty damn good uh, because it's an important thing. And actually, surprisingly, several news outlets used this one. And when I looked at the price, it was 200 bucks. So that was an easy buy because uh, for audio equipment, that's really not bad. And it's obviously lasted a long time. And it sounds pretty good, which we're recording both tracks right now. So this is how I would be talking at CES or something like that. And you can hear the audio difference between the lab and the reporter mic when I switch between them. And Andrew will, of course, unfortunately have to silence or whatever and work with the tracks. But that's the idea. So uh, this has really good quality when you're in a loud environment, which we're obviously not in right now. And at, on a convention floor with 10,000 people around us, it isolates pretty damn well. I mean, packs are covered from the floor there. It's really noisy there. We basically have to yell at each other to hear each other uh, with the interview subject, but the mic makes it so it all picks up really well without any of the background noise being, uh, making everything else inaudible. So that's the mic. The receiver transmitter setup is the G3 uh, sort of bundle. I think I paid $600 per unit for those and the transmitter was something like 150. Uh, and then it's all plugged into a recording device that we've also shown in the past and that was another $400 or something like that. So it does get pretty expensive pretty fast. Uh, but that's the basic setup. Fun fact about this microphone, it is now famous because uh, Linus from Linus Tech Tips came over to borrow it during an AMD video. We were in the AMD suite at the same time at CES and we finished shooting our video. He came over and said, hey, we are, we don't have the receiver for our mic. Uh, May I borrow transmit? that? Uh, transmitter. No, I ha right, but do you have the receiver yes. as well? Yeah. Can I can I borrow both? He was like, no, I just just all of it, and so I let him borrow all of it because <laughs> they had I think they left one of their uh, things in the room. Uh, so that mic's now famous. If you look at his video with Rasha Kadori about Vega, you'll see that blue fuzzy thing in the, on the mic, and now you know you know the secret. Uh, next question. Oh, by the way, I'll, I'll just point out. Uh, of course, we work with Amazon Newegg like most other outlets do. If you do like that mic and you want to buy it, you can hit the link in the description below. Uh, I'm a big fan of the mic. I normally don't really 
sort of talk about things like that, but it's audio equipment. It's not part of our core coverage. So uh, that is one I like. Next question was from Gnome Fictio, Ficticio. Gnome Ficticio says, Ask GN, hey Steve, love the work, never leave us, please. Uh, so how does RAM frequency affect CPU overclocking? I read that having a more direct multiplier, say 10x for 2666, instead of 2800, for instance, could result in an easier time getting those last few megahertz out of the CPU due to more stability. Is that so with XMP? How so? Why? You know the drill. So memory overclocking is not somewhere I'm an expert in. There's, of course, plenty of places that's true because computers are hard and there's a lot of parts and there's a lot to know. Uh, so I did want to answer the question, though, because I like the question and wanted to learn more about myself. I sent the question over to Buildzoid, who is, he runs actually hardcore overclocking, and we've recruited him several times for videos, so he knows what he's talking about. Buildzoid said, uh, first of all, the question, the asker said something about buying a Patriot kit and feeling some regret and maybe wanting a G-Skill kit instead. So I passed that along to Buildzoid as well. He said, uh, there with those specific kits, it doesn't really matter. But some RAM multipliers are just completely broken on some platforms like X99. Lots of boards can't do X28 or times 28 on the RAM. So you're stuck with 2666 or 3000. It's pretty much tied to the CPU memory controller, the BIOS and the board layout. And I asked him about Z170 and Z270, and Buildzoid said, on Z170, some of the really high multipliers are also broken. On Z87 and Z97, if you want to go over 3,000 megahertz, you would generally run a high BCLK with a lower multiplier rather than trying to run 30X or higher multipliers. And he had a bit more, two more blocks of text to go through that are all pretty interesting. Depending on the platform, BCLK affects literally everything. On Z170, the BCLK for the chipset is separated from the CPU, RAM, and Uncore base clock, but in the past, base clock affected everything from SATA ports to the CPU core clock, and actually you can see that by just adjusting it yourself without even applying it, and you'll see some of the other numbers increasing in BIOS, depending on your BIOS and motherboard. He also said... Uh, also, going back to the RAM, it won't affect your core clock till you start pushing some really high speeds on Z1. So on Z170, that would be 3866 and up. And then further said on X99, it doesn't do anything to core clock because the, I think he's talking about base clock, doesn't do anything to core clock because the memory controller completely gives up before, oh yeah, completely gives up before you get anywhere near speeds that affect the core. Uh, so that's... Uh, problem with again x99 we've seen that issue too where you just can't you can't push the memory that high with really specific multipliers and that's exactly what he's talking about here some multipliers just straight don't work uh, further set z97 and z87 past 2400 megahertz some cpus start having issues on am3 plus 2133 can be problem problematic as for his actual ram choices i would probably go for the c15 2666 g skill kit since g skill generally has better mobile compatibility and if he decides to OC, the RAM will probably go higher. So this is the answer to that question. Uh, I think that's kind of the quick version of it, but you get the idea. Next question is from Landstrike Gaming, who says, Steve, I'm having issues with the fans on the XFX 488 gigabyte GTR 1338 megahertz. In Wattman, I set the fans to turn on at 300 megahertz acoustic level and set the thermal limits at 55C and 40C target. The fans are not turning on to cool the card when idle. My PC repeatedly displaying a heat warning at 55C. I try to adjust the settings in Wattman and the fans just are not responding. Uh, so I don't have that exact card, but if, if you are not aware, most modern GPUs, AMD and Nvidia alike, depending on the AIB partner uh, more than the GPU vendor, but the AIB partner for most modern GPUs will allow for a zero RPM idle. The idea is no noise, and they let the temperature go up a bit. With some cards, like some MSI ones I've tested and EVGA, you can get as high as 65 Celsius before they turn on. And sometimes, depending on, the again, the partner, there might not be a bypass for that. It might just be a hard 65C it turns on, or 55, or whatever the number may be, and your only alternative is to toggle it completely off and lose that 
quiet functionality altogether. So I'm not sure if that's the exact issue you're talking about. I think I understand, and if I do, that is all it is. It's not a big deal. Uh, the fans just don't spin up if it's under low load. The card is fine. It's not being actively hurt by this temperature of whatever, maybe a 65, 70 even. Uh, it is completely fine. It's just trying to run without any noise. Next question is from Neo Voodoo Tech, who says, question for next week. Steve, what do you think about using a small fan or heat sink to cool routers and modems? I've recently been experimenting and found some positive results for cooling your network hardware, including lower pain and latency and slightly faster sustained downloads and transfers. This is actually a really cool idea. Uh, it's not something I've done, but I have read about it in the past. And so depending on your, if you've got a switch especially, like we use a, a gigabit switch for internal transfer, when that starts really getting hammered by multiple computers, it does get pretty hot and the internal cooling solution is not great. So in that situation, adding an aftermarket cooler, uh, even to our internal unit would probably be pretty helpful because Thermals ruin everything. Once you get higher heat because it's been abused for a longer period of time and it doesn't get a chance to cool down, and that's true with pretty much any electronic, uh, you will have performance degradation. It doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. And that's either because they have uh, restrictions built in there to protect it and make sure it's not running too hard of a clock rate or whatever when it's under load, or it's just because there's degradation because it's becoming uh, unstable or volatile or whatever. And then also, of course, it's not great for electronics in a small box with poor ventilation and a high uh, amount of utilization to just sit there and burn themselves for years and years because eventually you're going to have issues where it's just hot all the time because it's burned through the thermal paste or uh, the cooling components, the passive components have shifted just because of heat expansion and contraction constantly. Um, I, I would say it's an interesting idea. I haven't tried it but I kind of want to now. Uh, I will say for routers, I haven't had as much, well, I should say for uh, for modems, which isn't really what they are anymore, but you, you know what I'm talking about, the box from the ISP. Uh, I haven't had as much of an issue, but maybe if we started pushing the higher one gigabit per second data rates once that's available, maybe that would actually be a problem, I don't know. But with my current internet, it's just not. Uh, <clears throat> for the switch though, absolutely, that wouldn't be a bad thing to do because you would be able to maintain, like you're saying, the higher performance because it's not going to have to downclock or throttle itself in order to keep up and keep temperatures down. And that's especially true if you have it in a hot environment uh, or high ambient. Next question, Charlie Lee says, why do we need IHS, integrated heat spreader? Isn't putting a heat sink directly onto the CPU more efficient? Yes, absolutely it is more efficient. If you have no IHS, that means, basically anyone doesn't know, it's a substrate, that's the green bit, and then there's a die, and then over that is the IHS, or basically a piece of metal that helps conduct uh, the, in theory, conduct the heat from the die, spread it a bit, and then from there, the CPU heatsink should be conducting that. And we talk about that, by the way, in our TLDR video on CPU heatsinks. There's an animation and everything. It's pretty cool. Check that out. But that's how it works. So it would certainly be more efficient if you had direct contact, and that's what happens with GPUs. If you ever open a GPU, or a video card, I should say, you'll see that once you pull out those four screws for the heat sink and pull the heat sink off, it's just a straight die. There's no IHS. Uh, it is far more efficient to have direct contact. You don't have another interface in between them. And it's not just one interface, by the way. For an IHS on a CPU, the die doesn't directly talk, doesn't directly communicate its heat to the IHS. It's got to be something in between. It's not a perfect match. And the same is true from the IHS to the heat sink. It's got to have an interface between it. That interface is normally thermal paste. Sometimes it's liquid metal, depending on if you've, if you've uh, delitted it or not. And we do, by the way, have a delid kit, and I will be playing around with that pretty soon. But uh, that's the idea. So uh, if you have a dye and then thermal compound, which the current generation of KB Lake 7700K thermal compound does not look at all like it's consistent. We're still investigating that, but uh, thermal compound, IHS, thermal compound by the user, or Tim, uh, and then your cold plate. That's a lot of things to go through to get to the cold plate, which is your highest watts per meter Kelvin conductivity. So you don't want all those interfaces there. So why not just sell a CPU with no IHS? If Intel knows people are gonna put a heatsink on it, because of course, why not sell it that way? The reason is strength, primarily, because if you have, uh, if you've ever, 
maybe not deleted, but if you go look up YouTube videos of people trying to delete CPUs, I'm sure someone's cracked either the entire thing or the die because those silicon dies are really weak. They can crack on GPUs and on CPUs very easily if you're not careful, either from the DLID process itself or from applying a cooler. The IHS does a pretty good job of protecting that thing and strengthening it. So when you go torque down the four screws for the cooler on the motherboard, it's not gonna crack anything in theory. But the problem is a lot of folks will uh, either use sort of gorilla force when they tighten their things down until they can't physically turn the driver anymore, even though you only need one or two threads really locked to have strength. Uh, and if they do that, then it's just, it's not gonna be good when there's no IHS. Might, something will probably crack. And either that's gonna be pins, uh, if it's something like an AMD CPU and you've got no other weak point, uh, although that's not really something you see a lot, or more likely it'll be the die if it's delitted. So that's why the uh, the IHS is on there. It does theoretically conduct heat, but it, I would not say it helps conduct heat uh, insofar as uh, improving the thermal transfer properties. It is improved only uh, <laughs> only as far as, I don't know, it, adding more interfaces is always bad. Uh, that's the short of it. The next question, Mike, or Mikkel rather, uh, Bledzo says, question for Steve, say I have my wireless USB dongle plugged into the USB 3 header on top of my computer, but the speeds aren't consistent. I've moved everything away from it, have it top and center, yet speeds are still fluctuating a lot. Would it be better to plug it back into my motherboard? I've had this problem a lot. We use wireless transmitters, uh, or just say the wireless dongle is just for uh, use in other rooms where it's not hardwired, although I do prefer hardwire, but the, the problem is either, well, one, USB 3 drivers for those controllers on the boards, depending on what motherboard you have, they aren't always that consistent. Connection drops all the time. I had the problem on most systems I've built in the last few years. At some point, you lose connection. And that's because of the controller and the driver just not being stable. It could also be the key itself. If it's trying to, if it's just not a high quality one, there's plenty of $20 dongles out there I wouldn't recommend. But I've never had a problem plugging my uh, wireless receivers, transmitters into the back of the computer straight into the motherboard. That'll be handled more directly without any external, uh, any third-party controller. Now, with Intel and their modern chipsets is a bit different, but with the older AMD stuff or stuff before USB 3 was onboard natively through the chipset, that was absolutely a problem. Uh, but yeah, I'd try putting it in the uh, motherboard and then wipe the drivers as well and see if that helps. Next question, Daniel Duddis says, could you tell how much power can the motherboard VRM supply to the CPU by a number of phases? For example, X amount of watts per phase, three phase VRM is barely enough for a 95 watt TDP CPU, but five is good enough for even a modest overclock. It depends on the components used. So. That's what Buildzoid does for this. I included this question because we just posted a video on the Gigabyte Gaming 7 VRM. It's an analysis that he did on the FETs, uh, everything in there, and voltage controllers, things like that. And you can learn more about the uh, sort of the what the phases can handle and how many amps can go through it and all that stuff. That's all in that video. The short answer is no, there is no hard and fast X phases equals Y uh, amperage or watts or whatever. It's just, it depends on the quality of component used. Finally, this one, I really only put in there to, to make a note. Uh, oh, well, I'm not gonna say that name, so <laughs> never mind. it was worse than I thought. Uh, you can go look at the previous video though, and I'm sure you'll see at least one uh, dumb comment. But thank you for watching. As always, Patreon link in the post roll video. Leave questions below to be included in the next video. Uh, trying to do these weekly as we've been doing for a while now. We've got a few shows coming up, but the next big one is not until Computex. Before that, it's PAX East, though. Uh, but we'll be at home base doing all the testing until that time. So again, Patreon link, postal video. These types of shirts might be going out in the future. Like for more content, subscribe, all that stuff. See you all next time.